Lord. Isn't it so good to be back in the house of Jesus? We've come to welcome Him. We've come to welcome His presence. We've come to welcome His Spirit. And in doing that, we welcome one another as well. We've been closed for a little while during this lockdown. And by the grace of God, we've opened. And by the grace of God, we'll continue to be open. And we're trusting the Lord that we're going to go from strength to strength and grow from strength to strength. Uh, we trust the Lord that we would not have lost one bit of momentum because of COVID-19. We don't give any territory to the enemy. Amen. We are trusting the Lord for His grace. And I'm seeking Him for great things going forward and for Hillside and for our church and for our community. I've been praying to the Lord saying, Lord, where do we go from here? When we start, when we launch our services again, Lord, where is it that you would like me to take your people? Where is it that you would like me to teach from, Lord? Because, oh God, I am dependent upon you. Oh God, I am thirsty for direction from you. For every step that I take, every breath that I take, oh God, utterly dependent upon you. He started whispering in my heart, you know how God speaks to our hearts and he started saying to me warren i want you to speak to my people about foundations we need to get back to some we need to get back to some foundations in the house of god there are some wonderful teachings but gosh there are some lofty airy teachings going on out there as well and i believe that we will never move forward until we take a couple of steps back God wants us to advance His kingdom. He wants us to move in. There's so much that He wants, wants us to move into. But God says, listen, while I'm moving you forward, don't forget your experiences of the past. Don't forget the lessons. Don't forget the discipleship process. Don't forget what I've built into you. It's pointless me taking a bunch of shells into the promised land. I don't want empty people. You've got to remember where you came from. You've got to remember what I've been building into you because you are my workmanship. And as we've been dealing with foundations, and as God was speaking to me about foundations, He took me to a scripture that I know many of us are very familiar with. He took me to John chapter 3, and, and yet was an encounter that Jesus had with a man of the Pharisees, of the party of the Pharisees. This man's name was Nicodemus. And I, I believe Nicodemus was an amazing character. He's only mentioned in the Gospel of John, and then he's only mentioned three times. Yeah, in chapter 3, uh, in chapter 7, and in chapter 19. An amazing man, and he became an amazing follower and disciple of Jesus. But in this encounter, this foundational encounter that he had, he was not yet a follower of Jesus. Let me not run too far ahead of myself. Let me read from the Word of God and let's allow the Word of God to instruct us. Shall we do that? If you're in agreement, let me hear an amen. If you love God's Word, let me hear an amen. If you love being in God's house, let me hear an amen. Amen. A whole bunch of amens going on here this morning. John chapter 3, I'm just going to read two verses. I'm not going to rush it. We're not going to gobble it up. We are this morning, we're going to savor God's Word. We're going to enjoy the flavor of God's Word. We're not going to swallow it in gulps. And so we'll return to this message again next week and we'll build up on it perhaps the week thereafter as well. But we've got way too much to try and cram into such a short session this morning. Let's read the first two verses of John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now sometimes when we read the scriptures, sometimes the, the messages that are preached, we get the idea from scripture or from the messages and, and wrongly so that Jesus had something in for the Pharisees. Let me tell you, Jesus didn't have anything in for the Pharisees. Jesus doesn't have anything in for anybody. We don't serve a vindictive Jesus. We, we don't serve a I'm going to get you Jesus. The, the Bible tells us very clearly that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world. 
And so I believe that whether Jesus was interacting with a Pharisee or whether he is interacting with a Sadducee, whether he is interacting with a Samaritan, whether he was interacting with a poor person or a rich person, that didn't change Jesus' heart and Jesus' approach to people. Just because he was a Pharisee, it's not like Jesus said, mm, come on, I'm about to teach another one a lesson here, put him in his place. That's not the kind of Jesus that we serve. Jesus is the type that says, come unto me. Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And God knows that sometimes our being weary and heavy laden is not restricted to just physical fatigue. Sometimes we are spiritually tired. Sometimes we are spiritually worn out. Sometimes we've been doing so much study and so much input that we don't have the time. We haven't been energized by what we've been receiving from God and it wears you out. There is no end to the writing of many books. It wears you out. And let me tell you, you who have a passion for study, you who have a passion for God, you have a passion for the reading of God's word. Don't let it all just be study. You need to take God's word and let God's word speak to you. When you just read and read and read, you'll get exhausted. But when you allow God's word to speak and speak and speak, you'll get reinvigorated. You, you'll get rejuvenated. You, you, you'll get inspired once again. Allow God's word to speak to you. Oh, blessed saint in the house. So we have a man of the Pharisees that came to see Jesus. Jesus did not condemn him. Jesus did not say, Whoa, yes, yes, like a dumb man. Jesus didn't put him on a spot. I believe Jesus approached him uh, or allowed him to approach him. And, and Jesus answered him exactly the same way that he would answer any person that came to him with a genuine question, any person that was genuinely seeking. See, the ones that I saw Jesus did put in their place were the ones that came and asked questions because they were trying to trap him. But not so with Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus with a genuine question. And to him he saw the son who didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. You know, that scripture where it says Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn, I mean, that's John 3.17. Most of us know John 3.16 as a scripture verse. But let's just go a little bit further. Let's go into verse 18. And there you'll see what it is that does condemn a person. It's not the son that condemns a person. If you read it carefully, it's their belief system that condemns them. Everybody has a belief system. Everybody. Atheists have got a belief system. They may not believe in God. They may not believe in a God or a possibility of God. But they believe in something, whether it be their sciences, whether it be their learning, their intellect. Everybody has a belief system. And your belief system is either going to be something that sets you free, or it's going to be something that puts you into bondage. This morning I want to ask you, does your belief system in Jesus Christ set you free? There are some people who believe in Jesus Christ, but their belief system is not based on the Word of God, and so they're in bondage. I trust this morning that every person associated with Hillside, every person listening to the message this morning is free in Christ Jesus. You can feel a hallelujah welling up on you inside, on the inside of you. Going, Amen. I am free in Christ Jesus. So important that you know what you believe. So important. Sometimes you can believe something without even knowing it. And then... When the push comes to shove, sometimes when there's a trial or a difficulty, what you believe comes out. This is why God sometimes puts us in difficulties or in trials. There are things that we are holding to. There are belief systems that we're holding to that God wants to show us. Because before God can address something, God wants to show it to you and how it's manifesting and working in your life. So that you can labor with God. God doesn't want to do things against your will. God wants you to be in agreement so that you can put your hand in His hand and keep in step with the Holy Spirit. A belief system is so important. Don't think just because you come to church that you're okay in the department of belief systems. Nicodemus had a belief system. 
Oh boy, did he have a belief system. And he felt very safe in his belief system. He had a belief system that made him feel very superior to everybody else. Because not only did he belong to the chosen race, not only was he offspring from Abraham, not only was he an Israelite, but he was an Israelite among Israelites. He was a leader of the Jews. He, he, he had attained to the highest levels. He, he hadn't just become a leader of, of, of a group or a house church. He hadn't just become a leader of an economic sect. Nicodemus had become a leader, part of the Sanhedrin, some people believe. And here he was, Nicodemus, a man that had learnt to trust in his belief system. A man who had learnt to invest all his peace and all his hope in that belief system. But he was also a man who was all too aware that something wasn't quite right in his belief system. Something was being shaken in his belief system. See, everything was okay in the land of Israel. Everything was okay in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Everything was going just fine until a man by the name of Jesus pitched up. And Jesus started messing with everybody's theology. Jesus started messing with everybody's belief system. Oh, praise God for the day that Jesus messed with my belief system. Oh, praise God for the day that Jesus called me aside and said, Come, Warren, come and sit with me. Let me talk into your ear a little bit. Don't just swallow what everybody else is swallowing. Don't just believe what everybody else is believing. Let me impart it into you. Let me speak it into you. Let me invest it into you. And then let me lead you. Let me guide you. Let me walk with you. Let me shepherd you. Oh, God. Praise God. For the blessed day that he messed with my belief system. Something about Nicodemus that I read here in the scripture. If you look very closely. Before we're even told his name. We're told something very important about him. Something pivotal about the makeup of the man. Before we're even told his name. We're not told his height. We're not told his family relations. We're not told his political orientation. We're not told his social standing, per se, on the ladder. We're, we're not told uh, how much money he has. We're not told what promotions he's had. We're not told how angelically he sings in the choir. We're not told what board he sits on, except we're told the company that he kept. We're told the word of God tells us a man of the Pharisees. A man of the... This is how scripture has chosen to introduce us to this wonderful personality called Nicodemus. So much else scripture could have told us about him. But the first thing that scripture tells us about him is the introduction of this man Nicodemus by way of, by virtue, by uh, his associations. I am here to declare to you today, church, the company that you keep matters. The people that you hang out with matters. Now when you're young and you mix with the wrong company, it matters to your parents and they try and warn you. When you get a little bit older, your parents try and warn you, but by then you're flying solo, you feel so emancipated, you've got your life all together, you're busy living on your own, and you will hang out with who you want to hang out with. When you start growing up, you can start seeing the toll that certain company has taken upon you. There is no better company than that of Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior. There is no better company to keep than him who redeemed you, him who created you, and him who purposed you. Company is so important. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13, 20, He that walketh with the wise man shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. He that walketh with the wise shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Now hold on. Let's just break that down a little bit. Let's just have a quick look at what Proverbs 13 has just told us there. 
He that walketh with the wise, or he that walketh with the wise man, shall be wise. And then there's a contrast. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Now if there's a contrast happening, hold on one second. Should the Bible not read, he that walketh with the wise man shall be wise, but he that a companion of fools shall be a fool. We would expect that contrast. But no, the Bible makes no such contrast. The contrast to walking with the wise is not becoming foolish. The contrast with, with not walking with the wise or the contrast with walking with the wise is being utterly destroyed. I have seen people, I have known of people whose lives were on a path, man. And you could see this young person had talent. You could see this young person was heading somewhere. They had invested their life into a, into a course. They had been groomed. They had been steered. They had been educated. The way had been paved. Education had been paved, uh, paid for. That sporting uh, uh, bursary had come through. And then they started messing and mixing with the wrong people. They started hanging with the fools. We need to say goodbye to the fools. If you want to make anything of yourself, you're going to have to say goodbye to the fools. Those that are closest to you, those that are going to influence you, those that are going to inspire you, let those be men and women of character. If you're going to listen to somebody, then listen to somebody who has something to say. The company that you keep never leaves you unchanged. The company that you keep always change. How is the fool destroyed? Well, they could start their life walking on a path and because of a bad choice, because of a wrong choice, one pivotal moment they choose and instead of their life heading towards the destiny that God had for them, one foolish decision, their life goes off on the wrong path. They walk out on that job. They walk out on their family turn around and declare their independence and they can do it all themselves. And in that moment, the young person who was developing into somebody spectacular, something in him died with that foolish decision. Oh God, have mercy. Church, I started off by saying, check your belief system. To that I say to you, check the company that you keep. Nicodemus, was a man who kept very high social company, kept company of the Pharisees, and, and he had to pay a price to keep that company. Oh boy, did he have to pay a price to keep that company. He, you don't get to hang out with the Pharisees by being apathetic. You, you, you don't get to, to hang out with the Pharisees by lying on the couch and watching CNN sport or, or watching rugby all day. You don't get to hang out with the top people by flicking through the late night movies all night. You don't get to do that. You have to pay a price. And so Nicodemus was a man who had dedicated his life to study. He was a man who, who, who had cut off all the wrong influence. He, he, he was a man who had, who had an aim. And he worked towards it and he sacrificed towards it. But, but here's the thing. Although Nicodemus had worked so hard, he was so empty. Because everything that he had put his ambition into, all his study, uh, everything that he had put his hope into, that which he aspired to be, got to the top of the mountain and discovered he'd been climbing the wrong mountain all along. Discovered all the energy that he'd invested. Everything, when he got there, it wasn't nearly what he expected it to be. Have you ever been in a situation where you have sacrificed. Maybe it's in a relationship where you have just plowed in and plowed in and plowed in and plowed in and, plowed in and, and cried the tears and, and, and paid the money and, and cried the tears and invested emotionally and all of a sudden you realize, wait! Oh no, this is the wrong mountain here. Nicodemus did that with a system. It was a system that saturated everything to do with the Jewish way of life. He had become so good at it. He had become so adept at it. He had become a leader among the Jews. But, but, but 
Although he was a leader, he was an empty leader, no less. And, and so what we get is we get that this man, who was a man of influence, become a leader among the Jews. We, we, we get to understand that there was a group of Pharisees. Nicodemus wasn't alone, but some of them, maybe a group who had started becoming a, a little bit disillusioned with the system, right? The Holy Spirit had started stirring, not just one, but with a group. We, we know that it was a group because when Nicodemus approached Jesus, he didn't come to Jesus and said, Jesus, I know. He said, Lord, Rabbi, we know. We, we have been speaking. We have a question for you. Oh, thank God for those questions that we have for Jesus. There was a man who the rest of the group was already sniggering about Jesus and mocking him, saying, who does this Galilean think that he is? Uh, who, who does this, this man, nothing good comes from Galilee, surely. Oh, he can talk the talk, but I guarantee you he's going to fizzle and fade away. There was a group that didn't believe that. And Nicodemus was one of that group, and he had a question for Jesus. Ah. I thank God for those questions that we have for Jesus. It was a question that I had for Jesus that changed my life. One starry night, I was sitting outside and I had a question. I said, if you exist, if you are real, and if you are the God of the Christians, then make yourself known to me. You see, I, I, it wasn't a condition. I wasn't being arrogant. I'd just been brought to this place where I'd given up on everything else around me. Everything else seemed so empty. It seemed so superficial. And, and, and then I realized that if I'm going to live a full life, if I'm going to live any kind of life that means anything, then I cannot live that kind of life without getting to know the creator of that life. Other, otherwise, it's just going to be so empty. And I just reached this point in my life where I was so empty and in a, in a form of almost desperation, almost in a form of rabbi. Oh, if you can hear me. Oh, Lord. And, and I thank God for the day that I asked that question because that was a, one of those pivotal moments in my life where God answered me. And I could have ended up anywhere, and I, and, and I shudder to think where I would have ended up. But today I stand here as a testament that there was a living God, a living Jesus Christ, who heard me ask that question, and by His grace, He extended His hand. He said, yes, I am real. Yes, I exist. No, I didn't come to condemn you. No, I didn't come to push you aside. I'm here for you. I've got a destiny. I've got a plan. I've got a purpose. Come and walk with me. Thank God. Here's what I want to say to you. If you, like me, let's get scriptural. If you, like Nicodemus, have a question for Jesus or about Jesus, here's a thought. Take it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus. Cut out the middle man. Cut out the middle man. Don't, don't go to your buddy. Don't go to your pal. Cut out the middle man. Take your question to Jesus and say, Lord, I've got a question. And ask him with humility. Remember, you're speaking to a king. I guarantee you, my shepherd, my great high shepherd, will answer you like he answered Nicodemus. Can you just see this beautiful exchange? Nicodemus came to him at night, probably approached him at night because by then the hustle and bustle had quietened down a little bit and all the Pharisees had gone off to their little Pharisee homes and all the disciples had gone off to their little disciple homes or the followers and, and there was just this time of, of intimacy between a man, just a, just, just a man with a question. When, when, when you cut away all the study, when you cut away all the social state, when you, it was a man that came in front of Jesus and he came to ask a question. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Now hold on one minute. Nicodemus, you, you, you were doing so well. 
you had approached God so well. You, 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 you came in humility. You didn't come with your flowing robes and your garb. You didn't come with, with your six-foot long scrolls. You didn't come with your pack of Torahs and your bunch of servants and scribes behind you. You approached him as a man. You were doing so well. Why did you mess it up, Nicodemus? Why did you come to Jesus and say, Rabbi, we know how arrogant that you would come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the all-knowing one, and you would want to declare to Jesus what it is that you know? So, 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 I, I've learned, I've learned once. This is something that I've learned. When you're in great company, learn to seal your deal. When you're in great company, learn to seal your deal. I, 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 I don't want to be funny and, and seriously as I stand here. I, I've been sitting in situations where I've been counseling with people. People have made appointments to come and sit with me because they'd like to get my opinion. They'd like to be to speak into their life and counsel. And we sit down and we open up and they talk and 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 talk. And talk. I, I've already, already said to so excuse me, excuse me. Did you come to learn something or did you just come here to vent or to air? Because if you, if you come here to vent, that's fine. I'll close my, note, my notebook. I'll switch off my thinking brain, my analytical brain. That's cool. I'll do that. If that's what you want from me, I'll do that for you. But, but please, next time, be a little bit more honest with me. Don't ask me to come counseling because that's not actually what you've come for. Tell me that you just need a sounding board. And if there's something in my, in my busy day as a pastor where, or my job description as a pastor where I can say, okay, I'll be your sounding board, I'll slot you in in that time. Somewhere between two and four in the morning. Somewhere. Yet was Nicodemus, he came into the presence of the Most High God, declaring to Jesus what we know. And, and, and here's the third thing I'd like you to be very careful of. Take, pay careful attention to your belief system. Pay very careful attention to the company you keep. And thirdly, make very sure that what you know is worth knowing. Make very sure that what you know is worth knowing. We know. Because what you know might be a half truth, partial truth, small bit of it, might be a total falsehood. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Well, is that the truth? Mm. Partial, small, little bit. Yes, Jesus come from God. But Jesus is so much more than just a teacher that comes from God. Jesus is so much more than just a prophet that comes from God. You see, being a teacher or being a prophet is not what got Jesus crucified. Being a, a teacher or a prophet is not the message of the gospel that got his disciples martyred afterwards. No, no, no. All his disciples knew they got to understand something about Jesus that Nicodemus would later get to understand as well. Is that Jesus may have been Emmanuel, God with us. He may have been Emmanuel as in God took a, bo a body or a flesh up upon himself. Yes, he may have done that so that he could dwell upon us. But never forget, Jesus is God. Jesus always has been God. 2,000 years ago, born in a manger, taken a clothing, but he's always existed. Always has been God, always has been the Son, always will be the Son. Nicodemus was not just sitting in front of a teacher. He was sitting in front of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The prophet Isaiah called him wonderful, counselor, almighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I call him Lord. He's also called the darling of heaven, the rose of Sharon, the bright and morning star. But I call him Jesus because Jesus is the name that is above every other name. I call him Jesus because that is the name at which every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. He is Lord Nicodemus. Oh, Nicodemus. Yes, you're sitting in front of Rabbi. also in front of God. We know that you're a teacher sent of God. Why? Now look at the next mistake that, that, that Nicodemus made. Why? Although he's sitting in the presence of Jesus, although he's sitting in the company of the King of Kings, that's not what his authority is. Look what his authority is. We know that you're a teacher sent of God. Why? For no one can do these signs 
that you do unless God is with him. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That's a falsehood. I know that Jesus did great signs, but let me tell you something. The Bible teaches us that uh, Moses, in the courts of Pharaoh, took his staff and threw his staff on the ground. And, and, and it turned into a snake. All of Pharaoh's wizards, sorcerers, and mighty magic men copied that. And of course, Moses starts swallowed up the rest. Moses did a couple of other great miracles. And then the, the, the sorcerers and the wise men did great miracles as well. We're told in the Bible that there are many false prophets. We are told of many great deceivers. In the last days, even the elect will be deceived, if at all possible, right? Oh, my brothers and my sisters, let, let, let me talk here. Let me talk here as a Pentecostal pastor. And let me talk to my Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Could the madness please stop? Could the madness please stop? There's so much madness going on in the churches today. Running after this sign, running off. Well, that one must be a great teacher. Woo, boy, he did some great signs. I, I want to declare to you yeah, in the name of Jesus and by the grace of Jesus, I would never, ever, ever host or hold a miracle healing crusade. I believe in miracles, but I believe more in the miracle worker. And his name is not Warren. His name is Jesus. You know the way miracles should work. And, and, and if, that's, if that's their ministry, let them stand in front of God and give justice as far as that goes. I wonder how many of those people that were healed then are still healed today. That's their ministry. But this is what I want to tell you. The way that the miracles work is that no glory goes to man. So praise God if I'm busy preaching and we're sitting under the power of the word and all of a sudden I hear, Woo! That back pain that I had for such a long time. Look at me. I can, I can, oh wow. If we're busy enjoying a church service and God puts on your heart to go and speak to that sister while we're under the power of the word and you do it and God uses you, praise God, severally as he wishes, the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts all under the power of the word and all glory goes to him. No, I would never want to be ranked amongst the deceivers or known as somebody with a great ministry of healing. No, no. The Bible tells me what ministry I have. And that's the ministry of reconciliation. Let God be the healer. I'm a Pentecostal pastor. I believe in tongues. I believe in healing. I, I, I believe in driving out of demons. I believe that we have all that authority. Oh, yes, I believe it. But oh boy, I'm always very careful to make sure I step back so that the King of Kings can walk forward and touch whoever he wants to touch. However he wants to touch. All glory be to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let us not invest our belief system, our faith system, in the working of signs and miracles. For the Jews look for signs and the Greeks look for wisdom. Not so you and me, brother and sister. What do we look for? The presence of God. Oh, the presence of God. And we know it, oh boy. Do we know the presence of God? Let God work how only God can work. Let God work how only God can work. I'm so thirsty. I'm so thirsty for more manifestation of the spiritual gifts. Oh, yes, I'm thirsty. But let everything be done decently and in order according to his word. According to his word. How do I know that Jesus is the son of God? How do I know that he's more than just a rabbi? How do I know that he's more than just a prophet or a teacher? By the signs? God forbid. God forbid by the signs. You see, we're reading here in John chapter 3. But if we go to the end of John chapter 2, John 2, 27, it tells us there about a group of Pharisees as well. Now, Jesus had just come from, from the wedding in Cana, maybe a couple of days, months, I don't know, later... Somewhere in that time frame. And people were saying the same thing. And, and look very carefully at what it says. It says, many believed in his name. Which is good. Because they saw these great miracles that he was doing. Right? 
Many believed in his name because of the miracles that he was doing. And if that's where the Bible stopped, that wouldn't mess with our Pentecostal theology, not one bit. But then the next verse messes with our Pentecostal theology. Many believed in his name because of the signs that he was doing. It goes on to say, but he would not entrust himself to any of them because he knew what was in their hearts. What? They believed in his name, but they would not, but he would not entrust you. There are many people sitting in churches that shout the name of Jesus, but they feel far away. They feel lonely. They feel isolated. Something's missing. Something's empty. Why? Jesus has not entrusted himself to you because you're running after the signs. You're running after the signs instead of running after the heart of God. Instead of running after the Lamb. You're making your list of demands. Flick the switch. Switch this. Put this on. Put that down. Give me a job. Give me a rest. Give me a this. And God says, give me a break. You're not my God. I'm yours. We are so precarious and close to making the same mistake. And, and as we're an end time church, as we're an end time church, would we dare Spend one day without honing the art and the science and the desire and the passion of Him and getting to know Him and spend more time in His presence. Would we, would we spend one more moment running after another healer? One more moment running after a sign? No. Oh, church. Oh, the last, the last day, church. Let me tell you, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Jesus Christ coming soon. Can I tell you who's going to know Jesus when he comes? Not those who are running after signs and miracles. Oh no. When the, when, the, when the sky is torn open and Jesus Christ comes for his church. When he comes to rapture his church. Uh, can I tell you who's going to know him? Those who know him now. And those are not the ones that have run after miracles. Those are the ones that have got his heart. Have got his heart. Oh praise God for the day that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ comes again. We're sitting in a day and age church that, oh, let me wind down a little bit. I, I, I could just preach another sermon now, but let me wind down a little bit. We're sitting in a day and age where there's so much teaching about prophecy and eschatology, end times, right? So much teaching about that kind of stuff going on. And there are so many people that know about this stuff. There are people that can, they got their theories about who the Antichrist is. Like, like one pastor so aptly put it, so many people are looking for the Antichrist that they've lost sight of Jesus Christ. And people, yeah, the, the ten horns, yes, Europe, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah, 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 Gog, Omega, got that, yeah, got our theories, yeah, good. And they fall into this category that, where, where Jesus is forever learning, forever learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Like the Pharisees, they were forever learning, but there was the truth in person, and they couldn't get him. They crucified him. There he was, manifest in the flesh, finally, after thousands of prophetic years of prophecy. There he was. What did they do? They crucified him. Why? Forever learning. They're never able to come to knowledge of the truth. So the Lord has put on my heart, church, as a pastor. Let me, let me share with you. I don't want to take, please don't get me wrong. I don't want to take anything away from these, and, and, and I say this, oh, these masterful teachings. On, on eschatology. I want to tell you there are some mind, like, there's some revelation. There are people teaching eschatology and things in a way I never ever could. God bless them. So my indictment is not to them, it's, it's to you and to everybody else running around trying to look end times, end times, this, this. Get to know Jesus. Ask him the big questions. Take him. Just be honest with him. Yeah, do I believe? I want to tell you something. This nonsense of does he believe, doesn't he believe? How do you know if you believe? Ask him the right questions. I guarantee you, you'll get to know Jesus believe and, and believe that he exists. Oh boy, you'll get to know. Just ask the right question. Yes, here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. If you ever ask yourself, what's it all about? I mean, seriously, this Christianity thing. What's it all about, right? Is it about learning scriptures, right? Yeah, I learn and I learn and I learn. And yeah, I know the book cover to cover. Boy, I don't know the author. Right? Is, is it about evangelism? Going out and winning too many souls. That's cool, but what are you winning them to? What are you winning them to? 
these souls. So you get them to church, but what, what's happening in that church? Is it about praise and worship and worship? How can you worship him whom you don't know? Because you're too busy running around, Monday to Sunday, you want to squeeze a quick worship session in. Uh, what is it? What is it? What is it all about Christianity? Christianity. Why? Why did we come to salvation? Why were we called to salvation? What is it that God expects of us? Ah, oh, brothers and sisters, such exciting stuff. And the Lord has laid on my heart that that we'll wait for next week. We'll pick up when we gather again. I trust that you pray for me, that God, that the Lord continue to reveal things and build in me for the sermon that we deliver next week. In the meantime, let me pray for you. I love you. I bless you in the name of Jesus. You are precious to him. You're precious to him. Oh boy, you're precious to me as well. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, oh joy of joys to know you. Joy of joys to call upon your name. You're the living God. Oh, you him whom my heart yearns for and longs for. I thirst for you. And for your presence, Lord God. And Lord, yes, my, yes, 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 what I come and I say to you, oh God, that we as a church, not just this church, Lord, I, I believe your, your community worldwide, Lord, your, your church worldwide, as we get ready for you, oh, as we get ready for your coming, I believe your soon coming, yeah, Lord. Let us be a prepared people. We don't want to be a clever people. We don't want to be Pharisees. We don't. Just prepared. Just prepared. Let us be a prepared people unto you. And we cannot do that in ourselves. And, and Lord, as, a, as, as an under-shepherd of yours in this house, I cannot do that in my own strength. No, I, I need you for that. And, and we need you for that. Because we are your workmanship. And we need your wisdom. And we need your leading. And we need your guidance. And oh God, more than any of that, we just need you. We love you. Oh boy, do we love you. Oh Lord, we love you. And as we're getting ready now to go our separate ways, I want to pray that what I've spoken this morning would be deposited as seed in every heart. That as we go out from here in our separate ways, and whether it be to our works, schools, colleges, marriages, relations, Lord God, I pray that what has been spoken here deposited as a seed would bear good fruit, great fruit unto your glory and to your kingdom. Because we ask this in your beautiful, precious, holy name. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless you. God go with you.